I see this podium is Clinton size. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. It's so wonderful to be in Arkansas. Um, not my first time by any means. For those of you who don't know, I have a very big Arkansas connection. First of all, my best friend in the Congress, well, when he was there, now I guess I don't have any friends, <laughs> was Vic Snyder. So I'm really thrilled. <laughs> really thrilled to have him here today, and I do miss you, Vic. And uh, you don't miss Congress, believe me. <laughs> but he was, in my opinion, um, one of the best that we had there. We would walk every morning. He would call around, and we had a little walk group together. And it was really great because it was one of those ways in which uh, we could start out the morning and we could hear what was going on in the different pieces of the Congress. Because in the Congress, you do your work by committee to a large extent. And so when things get to the floor, um, a lot of times you won't have the expertise for that particular bill because we're generalists in a lot of ways. And the expertise that we build sits on those committees. So um, I was very fortunate to have Vic on the Armed Services Committee with me where he and I served. Um, we came in together, we were put on the committee together, and so I have been for 15 years now on the Armed Services Committee, that's the main committee uh, that I have, along with the Homeland Security Committee since the beginning of its inception after uh, September 11th. And I also sit on the Joint Economic Committee, which is a um, Senate and House committee, where we really look at, really honestly at the comp competitiveness of the United States vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So I'm really happy here today to be with you to talk a little bit about what I see happening with the United States econ economy in particular. And of course, no better place than the Clinton Public, uh, uh, the School of Public Service. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, to serve in the Congress in Clinton's last four years while he was president. and. Um, for those who don't know, he made me one of his chairs of the Democratic National Committee during his tenure. So I got to spend a lot of time with uh, Bill, and I honestly always did call him Bill and still do, and I'm thrilled um, that it's not as rainy today as the last time I was here when we opened the, um, the library, for those of you who were here. And of course, Skip Rutherford, thank you so much for having me here today. And Nikolai Pipa, who uh, I know did all the work to run around and get this all together, and all of the rest of the staff here. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So I'm a Californian, which is a good thing, by the way. I'm a Californian. Uh, born and bred in California. I hang out in a place called Orange County, California. If any of you have ever been to the original Disneyland, then you would know that I come from the happiest place on earth because that is my hometown. And um, in Anaheim, we think big. I mean, Disneyland, Disney, Walt Disney did not come to Anaheim originally to build the best place on earth. He went to a lot of other cities and a lot of other places, and everybody laughed at him. And he came to Anaheim, and he actually, believe it or not, the piece of land that was sold to him was sold by my former husband's grandfather, who was an Arkansan. He owned, yes, you guys have a connection to Disneyland. That piece of property was owned by John Woods, who was my former husband's grandfather, and he moved, he was a doctor from Ashdown, and he moved to Anaheim, became the doctor of Anaheim way back then, and uh, he had that piece of property, and he sold it, and he sold it, and Walt Disney bought it, and the rest is history. But I tell you about this because we dream big in Anaheim. We believe in our economy. We believe when others can't even see it. So I'm an optimist, complete optimist. 
And I will tell you that when I was nine years old, I asked my father, an immigrant from Mexico, and so was my mother, an immigrant from Mexico, I asked him, why do we live in Anaheim? And he said, I've looked around at a lot of places, and this is the best city to raise my children and give them the American dream. And give them the American dream. The American dream is alive and well in the United States. I'm a testament to that. Imagine this, a dad and a mom who come from Mexico with nothing and end up to be the only parents to ever have two daughters in the United States Congress in our history. One generation. So when I hear or when I read and people say, yes, it's become a little bit more difficult to do the things you need to do, but there is no better place than the United States to get your stuff done. You young people, there is no better place to get your stuff done. And you older people, there's no better place to get your stuff done. Because you know what, I've got a girlfriend, she tells me 60 to 90 are the years you are more productive. And thank God, because I'm getting there. <laughs> so let's talk about the economy and what I think and what I see. Now, I'm an, e I'm an econ major. That's what I, I, I uh, studied. And then I became, I got my MBA. And then I went to Europe. And I studied international finance. And I was a financier. So, to a large extent, even though I do war and terror in the Congress, I actually get a lot of this, who's moving the money where and who's got the money and why is the money there and what do we need to do. Of course, most of the time I can't get my colleagues to listen, but we're trying. So here's what I think about what's going on. First of all, first, I know that there's a class here and it's on econ, so I, wanted, I want you to go back to what we know about economics. And when I was going through school in Econ 101, the very basic class that most of you have to take in order to graduate from university, there was always this idea. What's the most important, what are the most important factors to have to make something happen? The first people, you have to have either educated, thinking, smart people, innovative people, maybe you don't have to be educated, but you have to be, have an idea, you have to be innovative, you have to be willing to take that risk. People are the most important thing that a country has. And you know what has made America so great in such, for such a long time? Is that people come here. People come here. We let them come here. And people who leave their own country for a different country with a different language, in a country where it's not easy to be an immigrant? Think about that. What it would take to leave here and go and live in Brazil, for example? The people who leave, those are strong people. They're willing to undo what they know and go to the unknown. They go with the dream that the streets are paved in gold. But the reality of the United States is very different. You begin at the very bottom. I know I've seen a lot of people, janitors who came from Vietnam who were Chinese philosophy professors at their universities taking out the trash. Because that's what happens in America. But we let people come here, some with a lot of education and some with no education. And because we allow people to come here, we get that brain trust and that innovation and that desire to succeed. It's a good thing. And it makes those of us who have lived here for a while more competitive. So what has happened in a certain sense is this whole issue of immigration. I just don't bring it up because I'm Latina and I am for those of you, it's full disclosure, Sanchez, it's Latino. But I believe that allowing people to come here brings that 
desire to succeed brings new ideas, and in a global economy, brings the connections that we need. So people are important. Production capability. You know, there's a lot of people who do a lot of research historically. The best research, I think, are the Italians. If you really know the connection between the Italians and what we have been able to produce in the United States, you know a lot of the ideas came from them. The problem the Italians didn't have historically is they didn't have production. The United States had production. That's why we could steal the ideas by bringing the people over. We stole them correctly. And then we'd produce here. We had production. But now production can go anywhere. Production can go anywhere. And we've seen it when it goes overseas. Capital. You got to have money to make money. It's very difficult otherwise. And one of the nice things that we have in the United States is we have this Wall Street group, which are getting a bad rap right now, and for a lot of reasons they should, but they were also innovators over the years. And we have devices that allow capital to be put together and to be put in the hands of people who don't have capital so that they can run with their idea. That's what makes America different than a lot of places, historically. Now that can be done anywhere in the world. Natural resources, America's got them. But I think we're better stewards of our natural resources than the rest of the world, and we should be. But we have historically had everything that we've needed. Our big problem right now is that we have traditionally, in the last decades, brought in, for example, the energy that we need to produce what we need, not wanting to use our own to a large extent. And now that other countries are developing, they're putting their hands on the resources that we traditionally had at a pretty good price. And what supply and demand will tell you is when there's the same amount of supply but more hands grabbing at the cookies, the cookies disappear faster or mom starts charging you for them. You know? So it's become more expensive to get our hands on energy. And that makes things more expensive. So what can we do about this? It's a changing world. The first thing is, where do we invest? I believe that one of the things the federal government must do is to invest. It takes a lot of money to invest. Invest in what? Invest in people. Our number one competitive advantage that we have for our economy are our people. So. So I had uh, Greenspan before my committee maybe five or six years ago because I sit on the economic committee. And I asked him about education. He's not an education guy. And he said, Congresswoman, I'm not an education guy, but I will tell you there's something wrong here. When our kids get tested, when they're in the third grade, they're equal or ahead of the rest of the world. And by the time our kids get tested in the eighth grade, they're 37th in the world. Something happens between the third grade and the eighth grade to our kids. We dumb them, dumb, dumb them down somehow. You know, so we need to really understand that education equation. And I think a lot of people are trying to work on that, but they haven't come up with a solution. But we need to invest in our own. More importantly, the thing that we do well in education in the United States is our university system. 
And that comes because of two basic things that traditionally we have done at the federal level. One, we put a lot of money into basic research. The internet didn't just come along. The internet was developed through DARPA, a defense agency, a new, new thing agency. And we threw hundreds of millions, if not billions, at developing it. And you young people, you don't even think about it because you've lived with the internet world. But you know, I lived with the mimeograph and the slide rule. Yeah, things you guys would see in a museum today. It's so much faster. In fact, I'm amazed that they let you take calculators into standardized testing because we used to do everything longhand on those tests in the same amount of time and get about the same amount of grade. Yeah, and we walked hundreds of miles to school and everything else. <laughs> so basic research, the genome project. We know every gene you now have in your body. We've mapped it out. And that basic research that we collectively have invested in, what happens to that? Well, in those research institutions, our universities, that gets put into people's hands, people think about it, people are able to use it for free, basically, because the taxpayers paid for it. And then people begin to think, how could we use it? Maybe we could, maybe we could isolate the gene that does this kind of cancer or that does MS, or is it genetic? What's genetic? What about Alzheimer's? They start to study it with their own dime, you know, in their own time, and pretty soon they say, voila, I think I found a place to go. Then we go back to that capital system where there are places to get capital, to invest in a little startup, and then they come up with the new things, the new cures, you know, new heart valves, new hip replacements, you know, one of the reasons our Social Security fund is getting hit so hard is people, we're, 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 bi we're making people bionic people. They're going to live forever. But this is what we get from this basic research. It's a good thing. Because otherwise, we couldn't put these billions of dollars. Even, even the private sector would not invest in this basic research. So that's important to invest in. And then we tell young people and older people today, because it's everybody, anybody, if you want to go study, we're going to help you. If you want to work a, a night job or two night jobs or a weekend job to get yourself through and be a Razorback, it's not just about football. You know, we want you to study. We're going to give you. We're going to give you Pell Grants. If you want to go to law school and it costs $100,000 to go to law school, and you don't have it, and we know you don't have it because very few people have it, we're going to let you take out loans for that, and we're going to help you with that. That's the way a person who comes from no money can get an education and become a doctor or a lawyer or a research scientist or an astronaut. We invest in you. It's an investment in our people. And the other thing we have to think about is if people are working, or if you're going to school and you get sick, you're not good for anybody. We want you to study. You can't study and be sick at the same time. It's too hard. You can't go and work on a production line. If you're sick, you'll get everybody else sick. So you stay home, and then there's a gap in the production line. And if enough people do that, the production doesn't get done for the day and we become less productive. So we have to make sure that Americans are healthy. We must invest in people's health. We just have to. All other major industrial nations do it. We are the only country where whether you have health insurance or not depends on whether you have a job and what kind of a job you have. It's crazy completely crazy. The system is crazy. And when people are unemployed, as we see right now, that means people don't have health care. 
Oh, and by the way, they wait for a very long time rather than go in and get checked. They have major problems. They walk through the most expensive place in the whole system. It's called the emergency room at the hospital. And they cost a lot of money to fix or keep alive. And who do you think pays for that? We do, those who have health insurance. So health for our people, it's incredibly important. It's important that when a person comes to work for me, they haven't sat for two hours in traffic because they are not a nice person when they walk in. If it only takes them 15 minutes or 20 minutes to get in, if they had a metro they could get on and they could read the paper as they came in, not only then would they not read the paper at work on my dime, but they'd be ready, they'd be happy, they'd be going, their mind would be working, and they would be more productive. So transportation, how we move things, we must invest in. You do, it's very difficult to build a highway on the private sector. And when we do, it costs a lot more because there's risk involved and there's time involved and time is money and money is time. So transportation, I think, is an important place for us to be investing. And communication. I mean, look at this internet thing. We don't even think about things anymore, you know? If you wanted, if you lived here and you wanted to close on a house in California before, you would have to physically go to California to sign all the papers. And you'd probably have to have gone more than once. Today, you can put it through email and away it goes. And you can get it done like that. And that makes us more productive. So when I look at what the United States should be investing in, it's people. It's education of its people. The health of its people. We should be investing in transportation, in communication, and, and in assuring that we have an energy source for the future. Personally, I'm an optimist. I'm a Californian. You know what? I do not believe that in another 10 years we are going to be dependent on fossil fuels. I'm from California, I've seen the next energy source. And it's not wind and it's not solar. Those are just what I call things to get us through until the big, big thing comes. And you know where the big, big thing comes from? I mean, I've seen so much of this. It's being worked on in California. It's an amazing place when you have innovation and research and technology coming together and smart people. I know you have places like this in Arkansas, but in California, it just seems like they pop up all over the place in so many areas. And in energy, we are working so fast on this, it's unbelievable. And I'll give you an example. And I'll show you an example of why it's so important for us as taxpayers to invest in these things. So there used to be this thing called Mission to Mars. It was under NASA, they wanted to go to Mars, right? And as one of the scientists told me, Loretta, when we go to the moon, it's like taking a day trip. You put everything you need in your backpack, and you put it on you, and you go, and you come back. Your water, your food. But when you go to Mars, it's like going on a three-week vacation. You need to have a hotel, the hotel needs to have food. There needs to be water there. You can't take it all with you. So these scientists who worked on this project were saying, what's on Mars that could create energy, water, hotels for us to be able to go there? And the most plentiful thing on Mars, sand. Sand. S-A-N-D, sand. The kind of sand I have at Huntington Beach or Newport Beach or Laguna Beach where I live. Lots of it. And these guys, six of them, developed an energy source 
made of this sand. And the nice thing about this energy source, it's actually not an energy source, it's a container. But what it does is it takes energy from anywhere. If you put this, and it looks like a little coaster, very thin coaster, if you put it against your skin because you got energy there, that's why you're warm, it'll take that energy and it will store it forever until you need it. If you've got kinetic energy, if you've got sun energy, whatever energy you have, this little thing will store forever until you need it. By the way, it's powering most of the Starbucks in California right now. Yeah, a little council about this high of a bunch of these little sand sheets, I call them, and it provides the energy needed at Starbucks for the entire year. So there are a lot of things going on. And these six scientists who developed it for Mission to Mars, guess what? We decided we didn't want Mission to Mars anymore, right? So then they needed a job. And they said to us, well, we developed this thing. Do you think we could take it and see if there's any commercial application to it? Sure, we'll sell it to you for a dollar. And they now have it. And they're prototyping it all across California. So there are new things happening every day that we as taxpayers have invested in. So I'm very optimistic that we're not going to have to worry about who's got oil or what price oil is. I'm not investing in oil stocks. I'm investing in the new, new thing. So our economy has dislocations. That's where things are changing and people in particular are dislocated. That's happening right where I live in Orange County. There are tons of jobs where I live, but they're not the right people to fill them because we haven't got to that point where we've trained them for what we need them to do. I think that's something. We don't train at the United States level, but we provide the funds or the environment or the tax credits for people to make the decision that I'm going to become this and for there to be a way for them to do that. So I'm going to end by saying, because I, I don't know if you guys have questions, uh, um, but I'm going to end by saying this. The president has a jobs bill, and there are a lot of things attached to that jobs bill. And I honestly do not believe that the votes are in the House of Representatives to pass that jobs bill. But I will tell you one thing. There are monies in there to try to figure out and help with the kindergarten through 12th grade system. And I told you, something happens to our kids three, third grade to eighth grade, so we need help there. There are funds there for community colleges. That's where people who, play, you know, didn't get it together in K through 12, or who are returning from a workforce where they're obsolete now and they need to be retrained, or they're immigrants with an idea and they just need to learn English so they can get into the banker and say, listen, look at what I've got. Or they're returning people, women and others who come into the workforce late in the year. This is where they begin their adventure to become more productive for themselves and their families in the United States. There are funds for community colleges there. There are funds for transportation there. There are funds for air, there are funds for trains, there are funds for schools. I think those are all important pieces. And there are funds for people who employ people. I don't know if that really works, but he's made concessions in the bill. So he's got a plan, and we're looking at it. Nobody's really, really happy with the plan, but it may be the only plan that we have. So over the next three, um, 
three months, you're going to see real battles, real battles in the Congress over how we move our economy forward. And the biggest one you're going to see is that there are a whole heck of new people in the Congress who believe that we, the taxpayer, should not invest in the health of our people, should not invest in the education of our people, should not invest in transportation, should not invest in communication, you know, that if we just cut everything and we get out of the business, that somehow the private sector will take care of it all. I come from the private sector. I was an investment banker. I was a financier. I get it when I look at projects. I can see the future with them. That's what I did for a living. And I will tell you this. I believe it's the federal government's responsibility to invest for all of us in the future. Because if we wait for the private sector, none of us, none of us, we'll see our kids having a middle-class existence. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Sure. All right, if, we, uh, if you'd raise your hands, the Congresswoman will take some questions, and please wait for the microphone to get to you. Yes, sir, in the back. Wait for the microphone, please. Congresswoman Sanchez, I have to congratulate you. You gave a fantastic presentation. You, you remind me, you do come from a place with Disneyland. You have that same energy that they have in Disneyland. <laughs> but you, what, the way you're talking, it seems to imply that if the public sector doesn't do things like transportation, the private sector will, will, will step in or, or somehow the services will be provided. But isn't that a kind of a a you know um, very rosy-eyed view of the whole process. There are very good reasons why people like the Koch brothers and others are not pushing for public sector investment because that gives them more control. It's the same oh. thing as what they did in, in Los Angeles when they killed the uh, the uh, streetcars so that the GM could sell more cars. It's not a a, 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 a zero-sum game. Well. A absolutely. Look, if you, you know, for those of you who don't, and I, I know I'm going to get a little pushback on this, but I truly believe this. And I come from somebody who had no power and had no money growing up. Okay? Money is power, and power is money. So those who have money have the power to continue to try to hold on to that money. And they'll do it in a lot of ways. You know, no business person likes regulation until they walk through my front door and they say, you know, this guy's being too competitive with me. I need you to put in some regulations. It's true. You go back and you look at regulation. A lot of it is to hinder the guy who's catching up with you. So they can say they don't like regulation. That's not true. What they don't like is the world is constantly changing, and they have to constantly change in order to give us what we need. And in some cases, they can't, or they won't, or they're too lazy, or someone had the better idea or was able to get the production together. So um, I completely agree that in a lot of cases, the federal government has to be there not to choose who wins and loses, but to provide a field, a playing field, where people can compete. And that's an important role of the federal government, and one which, of course, people want to eliminate, especially those the new takeover in the Congress. Questions? Yes, ma'am, right here. Hold on, just for the mic. Wait for a minute, wait for the mic, please. I think everybody is concerned about the number of jobs that are going to China and, overseas, and other countries overseas. What is being done to bring the jobs home? Great. 
What have I done to bring the jobs home? First of all, you are looking at somebody who did not vote for MFN with China, most favored nation status, or um, uh, uh, the, the China um, uh, trade agreements. I did not, okay? I did not, not because I'm scared of the Chinese. They got a lot of problems. Believe me, they've got a lot of problems. And, you know, they're like a little, they're like a powder keg waiting to explode. You think we have problems? They have a lot of problems. But why did I not vote for trade agreements like that? Because they cheat. I don't like to do business with people who cheat. You know, if we say that um, you have to take care of your people and you have to have health care, and we do that, and that's in the agreements, but they don't do that, well, they've cheated. You know, you know, there are three things, three main things that cause pollution in my state of California. You know what they are? The first one are cars, driving around in cars. The second one, locomotive engines throwing particulate, especially particulate tin, into my air to breathe. It's hurting all of my people. The third thing, the air that gets blown from China to my state. Okay? Why should my people, who work very hard and pay extra to keep our air clean, have to compete against Chinese who don't do that with their air, and then the air comes my way and we end up with their garbage anyway? So I don't like people who don't hold to agreements, and they have not held to agreements in a lot of different areas. So that's the first thing. You know, stop giving them. Yeah. Why do we give them those, those, those measures? I'll tell you why. Because today's, because everybody's in the today. Today I'm an executive so-and-so. If I get my foot into China, I'm going to sell my product. Who cares that in 20 years I've wrecked the air of California and I've put Californians out of jobs? Yeah. It's all in the today. And we all are in the today. If you've got a pension fund and you're looking, or a 401k and you're looking at it, you look at it on a quarterly or monthly basis, right? And if you didn't make something, you're like, well, my broker's not very good, right? I'm going to switch brokers because, you know, George down the street is telling me he's making 10%. George is lying to you. I'm going to tell you that. George is lying to you. It's all big talk. So we have to decide first and foremost, what we're going to do as consumers. We're the largest consumer market. Everybody wants to be in our market. So I don't like to trade with people who cheat. When they cheat, I call them on it. Unfortunately, most of the Congress doesn't agree with me because, you know, their friend's the GE executive or their friend's in our, maybe I don't have any friends. I don't know. But that's one thing. Cur the currency issue with China is a big thing, you know, which they have refused, honestly, to come and address. But I will also say this. China has a lot of problems. Don't think that they're just walking along and everything's fine. They're just, they're, they've got environmental problems. They've got people problems. They've got a problem that they've got more. Just think about it this way. They've got more guys. Like for every 100 guys they've got, they've got like 78 women. Just think about that problem, you know? I mean, there are a lot of problems brewing in their society. So, um, yeah, I, I look at trade agreements. I look at um, you know, currency exchanges. I look at the environment. I want them to play fair. And I try to move people in the Congress along the line that I think of. But I'm a legislator. I'm one of 435 in the House. There are 100 senators, and then there's the president. Yes, sir, we have a question right here. I wish to pursue this question a little further. Uh, it's a relationship between U.S. and China, and uh, particularly with regards to uh, the uh, business interest and relationship with China. We've seen more recently what you just stated, uh, that China is cheating. They're discovering this now, and it's starting to hurt their pocketbook. We're seeing some motion back, returning jobs to the U.S. Do you see that trend uh, is going to be continuing, or is uh, how I, that would, may play out? I, he's asking, you know, now, now the businessmen who have been doing business in China are figuring out that China's been cheating on them. That's, that, that, that's a statement. And so some businesses are coming back to America, and do you see that more happening? Yes, 
for two reasons. One, I think you're going to see more legislation and more tax laws, et cetera, um, favoring people keeping their businesses here in the United States. And the second thing is, yeah, people have now had a couple decades of, um, if you will, relationship with China, and they're realizing that they're getting the raw end of the deal in the long run. So I think you are seeing a movement back out of China. And the third thing is, China's really explosive in a lot of areas. And it's, you know, what makes America so great is predictability. Predictability. Political predictability. That's why this whole thing, whether we would pay the deficit or the, the debt ceiling or not, was so harmful to us. Because no matter what, you know, I mean, think of all the investments. If you had made an investment in Egypt, if you had made an investment in, um, in uh, uh, Syria, if you had made an investment in uh, China, any of these places are having real turmoil going on. You could have lost everything. The most predictable place is the United States. As a businesswoman, you know, I go into business because I think I know how much something is going to cost me, and I believe I know how much I can sell it for. And if there's a margin there and that margin is acceptable to me, then I'm going to go do it. You know, when I have to put in the risk factor of being in a different country, other than the United States, it makes that margin smaller for me. So. Yeah, I think businessmen and women are coming back to the United States. Time for one question. This lady right here has it. Do you think there's any chance at all that the super committee will accomplish what it's supposed to do? Well, that's why I handed out this thing to you right here so you'll kind of understand what's going on here. Um, with, because this is a big deal for the next three months. I mean, come Christmas, I'm probably going to be sleeping on a cot in the Congress, unfortunately, and maybe Thanksgiving. Um, the, the committee, the super committee, has to come up with a plan and vote on it favorably, and it's an equal number of Democrats and Republicans, and an equal number of senators and um, House members. And so one, if you will, at least has to move one way or the other in order for something to happen, okay? So they have until November 23rd to do that. If they don't, there are automatic cuts that will happen. Let's say they do. Then it comes to the Congress, and the Congress has an up or down vote on whatever they present, and we must vote on it before December 23rd. And if we should vote on it, then it goes to the President, and if he should sign it, then that becomes law. If not, we go into this whole automatic cut type of thing going on. So any of those steps are all perilous, right? They're all crazy. My belief, especially after yesterday's comment from Speaker Boehner that there'll be no revenue uh, in this equation, you have only to look at that pie chart, and I'm sorry that it's not in color and very easily distinguishable, but look, the only piece to a large extent that the Congress has control of is this piece here. Discretionary spending, that's everything we do. NASA if it exists anymore. Um, national parks, transportation, FAA, highways, health and human services, uh, CDC, you name it. That's half of this black spot. And the other half is defense. Okay. That's really what we control. So if you're going to have no revenue, I mean, you have only to look at this to understand. If you're going to have no revenue, then what you're going to have to do is pretty much eliminate most of what's in here, unless you do some entitlement reform. But entitlement reform, on the other side, this bigger piece, is a harder thing to do. You're talking about uh, officers, uh, retired officer salaries and CO salaries. Uh, you know, uh, I mean pensions, you're talking about Medicare, you're talking about Social Security, uh, you're talking about retirement for federal uh, workers. I mean, if you go and you look at what percentage of people in Arkansas get part of this pie, 
I bet you it's going to be pretty big. I'll bet you it could be 25%. I know in California, we have uh, 37 million people and 20 million people get something out of this piece of the pie. So that's politically a very difficult thing to do, especially when you look on it on a disaggregated level. Person, one person. You, have, you know your stories. Your mother's on Social Security and she's getting $800 a month. So she's going to take a 20% cut? Right? You're paying Medicare and you're older, you're paying on Medicare and you're paying Part A and Part B and, you know, it's going up and you've got whatever and, and you're going to take a 20% cut? You're going to look at me and you're going to say, I'm crazy. So, um, so I think come November 23rd, it's going to be very difficult to have a solution there, especially if there are no revenue increases. Revenue increases in the federal level means tax increases, for those of you who don't know. And um, there, if you look at traditionally what percentage of taxes people are paying, first of all, overall, generally speaking, Americans are paying less percentage of taxes than ever in the history of the United States. And secondly, there's a disjunction, there's a dichotomous situation going on where the middle class as a percentage of their monies are paying more into the system than those who have a whole heck of a lot of money. So you make the decision. Do you just not want to have Medicare? And there's nothing in place of it, by the way. They're not suggesting that we change it for something. Do you just not want to have Social Security? There's, you know, because you know, their suggestion is go at it alone. I mean, really, if you look at their proposals. So I believe that in order for this committee to come up with something, they're going to have to talk about revenue. And if they get something and then they move it to the Congress, I think it's going to be very difficult to get a yes vote. So I think it's a very laborious and difficult process for that committee. Let's, uh, thank you. Thank you. And again, let me thank... Uh, Let me thank him for being here and always welcome Congressman Snyder. You're always welcome here. And Congressman Sanchez, thank you very much. Adrian, thank you very much. And you all have a wonderful